So welcome to the Sex Tech warm up event taking place before the Sex Tech EU conference. And we're very excited to be in partnership with Wolves Summit this year. And that event will be taking place on October 19th. But today we are getting to meet some real powerhouse players in the sex tech industry. And especially because both of you are um, in a sector that gets stigmatized and subject to being stigmatized a lot. And of course that is porn. So I'd like to jump in and introduce Sarah Valmont and Lily Sparks. Sarah is with sh.com and Lily is with Afterglow. Um, and I'd love to start with Lily. I'd like to just know a little bit more about you and of course your company and the mission and values behind it. Yeah, so I started Afterglow as the sex resource that I wish I had growing up. Um, when I was 15, I fell in love, high school sweetheart, but I couldn't figure out how to have good sex because like, where do you learn about sex? Like, where do you actually figure out what sex is like? Like mm. most people, it's like middle school sex ed and it's like Pornhub. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of room in between those two things. And so after like our whole mission is to inspire great sex. Mm. And to do that, we really want to meet people where they're at. And, you know, most people ranked porn as the number one place to learn about sex. So at Afterglow, we are like a porn inclusive approach to sex, love and relationships. And we pair really unique, revolutionary porn stories with, you know, guided exercises, guided masturbations, mm -hmm. partner exercises, ways to really bring that into your own sex life and have porn as part of your sexual toolkit. Wonderful. I love this idea of meeting people where they're at. That's mm -hmm. lovely. Thank you. And of course, Sarah, I'd like to know as well about a little bit more about who you are and your company and your mission values. Well, I'm, I'm director of research and development at Shush. Uh, we always joke it's triple S with an H. Um, <laughs> I've Googled you like tons of times and I'm always like, what is it? Okay, it's S S S H and I will remember now. It's a triple forever. S um, with an H. <laughs> And um, Angie Roundtree started Shush in 1999. Um, so she's been in the industry uh, along with her husband who started his site Wasteland around the same time. So they're one of the early pioneers of the adult internet, both of them in their respective brands. But me and Angie, our work um, with Shush uh, has, has kind of been to carry on this, uh, this incredible brand and company that she's built over the last 22 years in which uh, she started out by noticing a void in adult entertainment where we have a lot of, um, you know, a lot of sex from a man's point of view, which is totally fine, but there's nothing that's really showing me the woman's take on the action or the, you know, centering on the female pleasure. And so from that basic, uh, you know, thing, shush came about and it's since evolved to, you know, encompass even more than that, um, you know, because that, all of our content is, ethically produced, very sex positive, and all about the mutual pleasure of the people involved. Um, so that's basically uh, shush in a nutshell. And we've been combining porn with sexual wellness and member submitted fantasies since the beginning. Uh, Angie maintains this just incredible uh, web survey, which I'll we'll talk more about later. Um, but we've always been about the members first and foremost. And um, it's, it's a great way to combine porn sexual wellness and sexual exploration, no matter what flavor you happen to enjoy, because we certainly don't put women or anyone else in a box. That's lovely. And actually, I'd like to piggyback on that a bit, just around this idea that really, yeah, you are pioneers within this indie content and you do create um, content that is made specifically for women, female identifying, a female identifying audience. And I know that you do do a lot of research and collect a lot of data and really look at your demographics needs. And um, so I'm, I'm curious about how you relate to that and how you kind of work with that. Um, yeah. Um, well, the, the survey itself is all internal, so it's numbers only. We keep you know, control of that data. We never publish it. We, we never jeopardize anybody's privacy because you know, we understand people want to keep some things to themselves, but we're grateful that they share their feedback with us because it really does inform our content. 
Um, and, and a lot of times what's fascinating to me especially uh, is how uh, media trends and just things in the broader mainstream world will invariably be contributing to people's sexual fantasies. So recently, um, we've gotten a lot of uh, people looking for real escapist fantasies. So, I mean, I wrote Mirror Game with that in mind. Um, but in the past, like when Fifty Shades came out, uh, we had women writing in going, we, we really want to explore BDSM. We want a little rough stuff. We want, you know, and people are surprised because you think, oh, porn for women, that has to be like soft and sparkly unicorns. And, and, and you know, and it's like, actually, no, uh, we are just as diverse and complicated as men are. Uh, if not, maybe even a little more so, who knows? Um, but we like what we like when we like it, and we change our mind all the time, so that's that. And so um, coming to that, I mean, with my own very open-minded attitude, I just, I love hearing all the different voices of people and their feedback and what they want. And uh, it's always uh, it's always so interesting to just see the way that human beings will want to manifest and express their sexuality. And that's such a lovely point to make that it, that sex and, and sexual fantasy is a constantly evolving kind of you know juggernaut really in people's lives, and it's not just a one trick pony, so to say. And yeah. that you're really kind of you know listening to that evolution in your demographic. And it's always worth reminding people too, as Angie and I have said in, in different articles, like uh, we did one for I think Ask Men about the whole conundrum of porn and sex ed. Porn is not sex ed but it is a fantasy. You are seeing the final draft of a meticulously edited piece and you didn't learn to drive from Gone in 60 Seconds, hopefully. Uh, so let, let's take a step back here and recognize that these are actors in a staged performance um, and it's edited and what you're seeing is a beautiful final draft. It's not anything to do with, with real life. And it's also okay to have a porn fantasy that you don't want in real life. You know, it's totally fine. So we always, um, you know, kind of put that out there to our members, like, you, you know, we're not here to judge you. And we're also not here to, you know, make you go, oh, well, you're not doing this. So it's inferior, right? Because nobody fits in one box. Yeah. And that's a beautiful thing. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I'm wondering, um, Lily, like, for instance, you had mentioned this idea of coming in because of this an educational component and also these kind of guiding principles. Um, Pulling, pulling back even maybe a little bit for, further, but with the idea, how did you come up with the idea of, of moving into the sex industry and then creating the brand Afterglow? Yeah. Um, so before I started Afterglow, I was in like the natural foods world and I, I sold products at Whole Foods and stuff like that. And like one thing that I learned is like, people still want to eat pizza. They just want to be told that pizza is healthy for them and have like a cauliflower pizza. Um, so sometimes I joke that like, that's kind of what we're doing at Afterglow is like, people want to watch porn, like 98% of men and 73% of women have watched porn in the past six months. But I think sometimes what people are really looking for is like more connection and more belonging and out of that. And that's what they're not getting out of a lot of the current, you know, mainstream experience. And so, you know, we want to be, we want to be there for your fantasy. We want to be there for your quick fix, but we also want to be there for, you know, other times when you're looking to, you know, share that with a partner. And then how do you do that? How do you, how do you bring, how do you bring that like the, the porn literacy and like thinking about, why are you watching this? What are you trying to get out of it? And like really kind of going to a deeper level and a, a deeper more and having more ways to explore than just visual. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love that because I think that especially I feel like a lot of what when women are getting into the, the sex tech um, industry, especially with porn, we're starting to see a lot more nuances, pulling back layers, asking bigger questions. Um, and so that sounds like that's coming from both of your brands in a really beautiful way. Um, yeah, I've, I've always just like really wanted to do something that supports women. And I just felt mm -hmm. like, you know, it, there's nothing in our culture that we do more, but talk about less mm -hmm. than porn mm -hmm. and sex. And so I wanted to really like release the shame and stigma around that. Cause I think mm -hmm. having a healthy sex life, like really helps fuel everything, like confidence in all areas of your life. And like, we were joking that, um, you know, we might have like a, a FinDom tutorial on our site and our viewers might, you know, they, they might not want to be FinDoms, but they might watch 
a video about how to be a FinDom and then go ask their boss for a raise. Absolutely. I think a lot of what we practice in the bedroom or with our sexuality, our fantasies can absolutely be applied in these different ways that aren't necessarily, like you said, the specifics for them. Yeah. Well, it's important to think, you know, the porn industry is a wonderfully large tent with, with so yeah. many different uh, perspectives and voices. And so, I mean, you know, I don't, you know, it's not my place to judge anybody, whether they want to watch a fake stepmom on browsers yeah. or they want like a more reflective cinematic uh, thing on show. It's fine. I mean, it's all good. It's all free sexual expression between consenting adults. And, uh, you know, we celebrate that as a brand for sure. You know? Yeah. Oh, that's lovely. And maybe I could also then ask you, Sarah, while you're talking about that, but you have, I'm, well, I'm curious about obviously COVID. This is the big, the big shadow in the room, the big elephant in the room, especially, um, especially when it comes to isolation and just these different social relationships we're now having to create and experience. And I'm curious, um, Sarah, um, you know, what do you see? Well, first of all, it, it's also been a, an occasion to explore ourselves sexually in different ways and to tap into the digital world and the virtual world in different ways. And so I'm curious, has COVID made a direct impact on some of your features or products? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I mean, the biggest innovation uh, to come out of the COVID period has been our new video viewing platform, Soiree, which is just so exciting. Um, it's really a combination of porn and intimacy and sexual wellness with that because Soiree allows uh, Shush members to directly invite a guest into a video room where you can enjoy any shush content you want, uh, whether it's a movie or a sex ed video or a podcast, something, you know, like a talk show. Um, and you can interact in real time like we are right now while the content is playing. And, um, you know, Angie came up with the idea just uh, really meditating on the loneliness that myself and so many of us experienced during lockdown. And it's not to say that we didn't already have a lot of cool stuff on the site to keep everybody busy. We, we've got erotic stories. We've got ASMR. We've got guided masturbation. We've got a lot of, you know, of great things in the catalog. But how do you bring people together while also, you know, being oftentimes stuck in either lockdown in other states or, you know, we even thought about military people, families who are far apart, right? I mean, all those situations where you can't physically be in the same room inspired Angie to develop Soiree. Um, so a year and a half later, we finally launched it. It's it's really exciting. We're, we're doing all these demos for people. And um, it's kind of surprising to me that it didn't come around sooner, right? Because, but then I guess people take for granted that when you're watching porn, that you're alone or maybe in the bedroom with your significant other. It's like, well, and what if you're none of these things? What if you're a, a filmmaker and you want to bring a journalist in and have real-time commentary on the piece? What if you're uh, friends or play partners and you want to see how do I do that shibari rope bondage? You know, and you can just sit there, eat popcorn, hang out, or maybe you want to use interactive sex toys in your relationship with it. Because um, we have we have sex toy movie pairings in the regular content, which is a lot of fun. But this obviously will inspire people to, you know, get in there. And it's totally private. There's no anything, you know, recording, nothing. Um, so people can really hopefully enjoy this opportunity to open up, to explore, and even beyond COVID, you know, if there's a, if there's something you want to bring up with your partner, like, baby, I want to watch this movie, but I want you to see me reacting to it in a whole other way. Like, that's hot. And there are just boundless opportunities to it. So in a, in a way, um, it was, um, I, will, I will never say that this last year has been great, but it was a very productive and wildly creative year and we're just getting started, so yeah. Sure, sure. And I mean, of course, sometimes these limitations and boundaries birth these incredible creative creative moments, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, so good, okay, lovely. Yeah, even during like, the lockdown, we had what we call like, kind of the shush at home program for people if they wanted to like film their own stuff and yeah. have it on the site. Like, I mean, porn is always a place where you will see innovation first. Absolutely, absolutely, and and yeah, porn is is lovely in pushing things forward. And I'm actually I'm curious around that. Actually, jumping from that, what you just said, Sarah, Lily, what is your opinion of kind of the the role or the dynamicism dynamicism between you know behind um, porn um, 
concerning the, the larger sex tech industry? Like, how do you do that? Yeah, you know, I think it's really interesting because I think that like, you know, our whole, the whole sex tech industry is around like opening up all of these conversations, like you mentioned earlier, and like opening up, releasing the shame and stigma we have around sex. And a lot of sex companies are very like female focused and supporting women. And I think it just makes us, you know, I love that we're able to be included in conversations like these where we can reach a wider audience. And that's really like one of our goals at Afterglow is to like reach reach new audiences that are probably watching porn but feel bad about it and really helping people um open up to new experiences mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely and you if, if if i if i know know this correctly so you kind of came out of the crowdfunding kind of yeah moment. so we, we yeah. did yeah. Yeah, we, we did a crowdfunding campaign and it, it's actually it's actually really interesting because I feel like the reason, you know, coming from the natural foods industry and like entering into the porn space has been super fascinating because I think there's a lot of ways that porn does lead in innovation, but I think there's a lot of ways that it doesn't as well. Like a lot of the technology that I think some of the companies use is like pretty old school. Um some of like the the business models that some of the mainstream companies use like you know it, the i learned that like the reason that one of the big challenges in the space is like we have to use high risk merchant processors that take like a higher percentage of the fees and a lot of the reason for that is not because it's people having sex it's because there's a bunch of membership sites out there that automatically subscribe you to other people's membership sites mm. and create this like inconspicuous billing on your credit card and therefore like have a bunch of chargebacks so it's like really hard to separate like the people in the space like us who are really trying to do it for the right reasons and like move the industry forward and like we have to get really it makes us be really creative of how do we serve our customers with all of these constraints and like i think you know one example you're seeing is like cryptocurrency adoption and, you know, everyone in the industry is like very into that. Um, so I think it's like a lot of the, we're dealing with some, a lot of the same challenges around stigmatization and it's really fun to work with other people in sex tech to help overcome those and find ways around them. Mm -hmm. And do you, do you feel generally welcome in the sex tech industry as I do I like I'm surprisingly yeah I think it's been amazing just to be able to um to be a part of it and to like talk with other people and like given given my background in like products it's it's really different for me now being in a digital space and so I love like hanging out with the product people and like hanging out with the health people because I think like you know I'm I, I got into all of this because like I care about women's health and I want to support women. And so it's like, it's just like even getting all the crazy ads on my Instagram, like Instagram thinks I'm like have period problems, like have fertility problems, like all of these different things just because of like all the cool sex tech brands that I love like learning about and, um, and meeting people from. Oh, lovely. And you, Sarah, you feel really welcomed in, I mean, as coming from kind of the porn sector, coming into the sex tech, is it? Absolutely. I mean, actually, porn embraced me in ways that conventional industry, and I was I was an academic before, um, just never did. And I found more freedom, more integrity, and certainly more creative freedom here. Um, the one thing I will say, though, about, um, what, you know, Lily was just describing with the payment things, you know, it, it's easy for a new person to walk into the industry and kind of see all that. But the thing that you, you might not be aware of is, you know, you are in an industry that's actively hated in America, especially the level of hatred for porn, for sex workers. Uh, I, I hear from models every week in um, our support group, Bella One Erotic Laborers of New England, uh, living in fear that their uh, credit card or whatever is going to get canceled if they get outed as a cam girl. Um, and certainly right now, MasterCard is making these really um, almost just really draconian laws for pay sites where you have consenting models. You're not, a, you know, a random uploader. Um, and, you know, there are just all sorts of insidious attacks on Section 230 from both sides of the aisle. So really, I look at porn and I love it because it is the bastion of free speech that holds tight. It is, it is the canary in the coal mine. It is the dark night. And people hate us 
but we exist and that's why the rest of you have the freedom to you know post your crap on facebook if you want to you know and not get sued um you know it's it's because uh, a man got shot and paralyzed uh in an obscenity trial larry flint um and now uh, groups of morality and media are not going after us for obscenity they're attacking payment processors with these uh you know campaigns that we're all endangering children that's why i was cringing earlier when you're like talking about being 15. We never mention anything under 18 in the porn industry. Like, right there, no, never, absolutely not. Uh, this is an adult space, we don't want your kids there. We, you know, yeah. I mean, I, I get what you're saying, but like, we live in fear of that. And you don't have that fear in any other industry where if you do one, if you say one thing wrong or you appear this, you might have your payment processor taken from you. You might get knocked offline. Uh, you might be deplatformed after a million followers. So it's really, um, it's it's an industry that makes me never take for granted my freedom and makes me even more passionate about having it for, for everyone's benefit, right? You know? Yeah. So one of, uh, what, totally, like one of my good friends and like advisors is in the cannabis space. And mm -hmm. it's just crazy to me how much more willingness there is to like advertise and all of these things in cannabis than there is in porn, which is completely 100% legal. And even, I feel like it's even easier in that space than it is for so many women's health brands that go through all of these challenges. It depends on the magazine with cannabis though, because I write for a few national magazines and that's still a no-go unless you're doing a feature on it. I couldn't even mention it in a certain erotic story because the publisher wow. would do that. So I just had to be sort of vague, like, they were in a greenhouse in the beautiful town of Kelowna. And we're just not going to tell you what's in the greenhouse. We'll just <laughs> it, you know, like so. It's uh, yeah, the the vices of the world. I mean, we're so hypocritical about it all, right? But yeah, is it is it a vice or is it really just part of the human condition that people are craving? Uh, an orgasm or their junk or whatever they need to get through the day to get through the, the pandemic, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and and to kind of take this a little bit further, like in the in this landscape we're talking about with being, um, with you know, being potentially um, with the with credit card uh, payment op options and all this kind of being under attack and all that. Well, also the landscape of shadow banning and censorship when it comes to that. And I am curious about what what the this is for the both of you, but I am curious about what the future is for the consumption and the creation. Of, um, for, of porn while, while dealing with this kind of growing censorship and shadow banning and having Cessna and having all these different movements behind that. So what do you see as far as that's concerned with consumption and creation, but also what do you see as some solutions or some looming threats maybe on the horizon? Take it away, either one of you, I wanna Sarah, know. Sarah, go ahead, I'm curious what you have to say. <laughs> well, um, I mean, there's always going to be uh, compliance in any industry, and ours just is now filled with a lot more paperwork. But um, hopefully, as some of the post Nicholas Kristoff moral panic abates a bit, uh, pay site operators and uh, groups like the Free Speech Coalition and APAG will be able to come to a more reasonable set of solutions. I mean, I'm not on the business end of that, so I can't speak to all of it. But I mean, it's it's always, you know, we want to be in compliance, right? We, we want to show that everyone here is consenting and happy to be here and agrees to the distribution and it's all good. So that's always going to be part of us. And it's it's been, I mean, Angie founded ethical.porn right when she started Shush. So we've always been about the fair and equitable treatment of actors, staff, anybody, right? Um, but as far as the, the cool stuff, the stuff I'm more involved in, um, I think what's exciting to me is the consumer appetite for stories. Um, because, you know, not a lot of people realize this that are young and, and looking at porn now, but in the in the early 70s, you know, when you could actually go to a movie theater and see a porn film like The Devil of Miss Jones or whatever, audiences were eating up these stories. No matter how campy they were, they wanted a story to go with the sex. Um, and, you know, obviously when I work with Angie, I joke that she's the Darren Aronofsky of porn directors because everything's deep and layered and, you know, we can, like, she'll let me tell really crazy stories. Like, if you've seen Neogram, like, that's part of a whole, like, you know, supernatural saga. And, uh, you know, it, it works out really well like that because it just so happens that our members are into stories. 
So for me, it's always being like, what's the next story? You know, what's driving the fantasy? I'm going to be there. And, and that's what I'm looking forward to. And certainly the opportunities that Soiree will open up with how we enjoy a Reddit content from a technical perspective really excite me. Um, because maybe it will even help to normalize um, people who have, you know, for whatever reason, they can't go out of the house and directly interact with a partner. Maybe uh, they're handicapped, you know, or otherwise like shut in. And they can now enjoy this beautiful part of the human experience. And even if it just makes one lonely person happy, like we're doing our job, you know, like um, we're bringing uh, that joie de vie hopefully into their life. And uh, that's that's just what I see going forward, like more good, exciting things. And, you know, we always like to keep our, our ear to the grindstone and, and listen and see, you know, what are people crying out for? So yeah, that's our role as content creators. Lovely, lovely, thank you. Yeah, I feel like it's hard, like once once you kind of open the box, it's hard to like put the box back in. So like with the rise of OnlyFans specifically and like more creator generated content, more direct relationships between creators and their customers, like even though we're going through a period of increased regulation, like I think it's clear that there's the consumer demand for that. And when something like that happens, it's it's hard to kind of like roll the clock back. So I think that's definitely a trend that's that's going to continue and is not going to, it's it's not going to stop. And I think, you know, as a society, like my, my hope and what I believe is that like we are becoming more open to these things. And, you know, I, I'm really like my, my dream or my wish is just like less discrimination for creators around like from society and, um, you know, all of the different like, getting deplatformed and all of that. Yeah, yeah for sure, for sure. Because nobody should be in a box at the end of the day. We're humans. We deserve yeah. to be uh, not judged on our sexuality, you know, as long as it's safe, sane, and consensual, everything's good to go, um, for sure. Yeah. But it would be lovely to see, um, you know, sex workers as well as the broader porn industry treated with but I mean, that's probably going, I'm, I don't mean to sound cynical, but I'm, um, you know, I don't see the, um, the anti-porn groups in America dying away anytime soon. And I'm, I'm new to the industry. So if you asked me about, you know, other like natural product stuff, I would be very cynical too. <laughs> or I'm yeah. a lot more cynical than I am now. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, also looking at kind of the, some of the patterns and trends within the porn industry, as far as historically speaking, being dominated by male voices or more of the kind of male identity or point of view. Um, do you think that your work or how do you think your work um, might encourage young or other female professionals to start their sex tech business? And what advice would you give these new entrepreneurs? That's for the both of you. I, I think there's actually like a surprising number of women in the industry today, which people okay. don't realize. Like there's, you know, Caden Cross. Um, she's uh, Vixen, right, Sarah? Uh, Caden Cross, uh, she's, I think she's actually working with Erica Lust right now. Unless oh, yeah. something else I heard. Yeah. But there's Caden Cross, Bree Mills, uh, Dana Vespoli. Uh, Sherry DeVille, who has a column in the Daily Beast, it's excellent. Um, there are a lot of wonderful, intelligent, strong women who are in porn and not just in front of the camera. That's definitely true. Yeah, and I think that like there's there's just so um, like in the whole women's health and sex tech and porn space, like there's just so much more opportunity there because I feel like that's just been so underinvested in that I would encourage like any female entrepreneurs to just like really follow their passion and just like if they see a market need to go for it and to really like make it happen because that's the way that we're going to create change. Mm -hmm. okay. But I will say that of the men of porn, I've met some wonderful and generous yeah. uh, established men in this industry who have been nothing but supportive um, who have been the first to congratulate me um, and, and Andy for sure. Like, um, so I think that's what I love about it is this is a space where we can have, uh, you know, men in their take, we can have women in our take yes. and we can go and mingle and enjoy life and enjoy sex as we should for sure. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm curious, what what might those? Because Lily, you had just said that you know, if if you are a tech a female entrepreneur, tech entrepreneur, and you're seeing a gap or a hole or a space or what, um, do you have any kind of examples of what? Well, this question's for both of you, but do you see any um, areas that could use more voice or more representation within the porn industry around specifically with sex tech? That's a good question. Um, like one thing that like, if I, if I were to come in today and like think about the place or like starting a business, I think it would be a lot around helping creators and helping creators monetize themselves as a brand. Because I think they're actually, you know, one thing that some of our performers have like joked about with me is like, they call themselves like P-list celebrities. Okay. where they have so many followers and they have a ton of influence, but nobody wants to work with them. Mm-hmm. And I think there's probably more people than you would think that do want to work with them. But just like, because, you know, I think the porn industry can be kind of insular because of obvious reasons they're under attack. We're under attack all the time. Um, I feel like there's, there, there's a lot of ways to, um, help creators, help creators monetize themselves. That would be really fun and exciting. Well, I would encourage any creator that's looking for resources to definitely attend industry trade shows. There are wonderful people who have marketing agencies specifically for only fans models or independent content creators. And uh, it's biz, why not? Like those are all wonderful shows where you can really meet these people and uh, you know, kind of gather who's, who's who in your field. Um, the other thing I will say besides like, I, I know, thinking of the void is, you know, over 22 years, Angie's seen a lot of brands and trends and things come and go. And that's just the nature of, of life, right? And I've worked with in the, I'm trying to remember, oh my God, like five years now that I've worked with her. Um, yes, okay, I'm staging myself in a while. Um, five years that I've been with Shush, we've definitely seen some things like be trendy and some things aren't. And, and so it's not about hopping on whatever's hot right now, what matters is your integrity and the brand you want to build. And, and that is what kind of gives you a foothold that allows you to keep on moving through time, engaging your audiences and, and content creators as well, and, and ultimately being able to be successful. So figure out who you are, what you want, and be into, you know, have integrity. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, wow. Wow, well, this has been an absolutely lovely discussion. Is there anything else that you'd like to add about any new exciting projects you're in right now or anything like that? Other than what you've mentioned, obviously you've mentioned a lot. So are you doing any collaborations or doing anything kind of, or are they top secret or is there anything you feel like sharing with me? I can't share too, too much. Um, but hopefully once, um, you know, this Delta variant business gets a little under control and people feel more comfortable flying, we can do more. I mean, it, it definitely has impacted us as far as not being able to go to Europe or not, you know, being able to fly people in. So we've had to really work within a narrow framework. But I mean, necessity is the mother of invention, right? So I'm sure that you know, hopefully the world will get more normal, but you know, porn will find a way and, and shush will too. <laughs> Our imagination anyway. That's lovely. Really? Yeah, we're, yeah. we're working on um, redesigning our website and really bringing the focus to like creating these like pleasure journeys of like guided kind of content journeys right. that can take you like, if you want to explore a specific topic, um, can kind of take you on like a learning path through that topic. Um, and I also just wanted to shout out that, you know, any of the listeners can go to xoafterglow.com, sign up. They can use co- access code PLEASURE21 for a 14-day free trial and see what we're all about. Lovely. Oh, wow. This has been really inspiring. I really appreciate both of you coming and sharing your time, your extra expertise, your insight, and really all of this. And, and, and mainly your passion and your vision. I think this is such an important topic because as you said, I mean, porn is really this reflective mirror about much larger things going on. And the more we talk and have discourse and are innovators, then I think it will really affect society as a whole. So I really wanna say thank you to um, both Lily Sparks and Sarah Valmont from Afterglow and shush, shush.com. And um, I'm going to close out by also saying 
that we are going to be in um, with the Wolf Summit in three weeks, and we're very excited to be there. And so if you have not got your tickets for the Sex Tech EU conference, please do so on our website. And you can always check us out on our Instagram where we'll have different updates. And of course, we're very excited this year because we're going to be uh, bringing together over 30 global brands. So stay tuned. I think this is a great way to kick off um, the event this year. And again, thank you so much, Sarah and Lily. Thank you, thank you so me. much for hosting this panel and letting us talk about it. Absolutely. Well, it was a pleasure, everybody. Absolutely. Cool. All right. We'll see you soon then. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye.